Okay, so today we're going to talking about FIRST Robotics and we're talking specifically about the Jaguar device and some block diagrams. And the block diagrams will help you sort of organize your thoughts as you are designing your robot. So here's a picture of what the Jaguar looks like. Uh, for those on the team last year, you've seen it before and I would ask you the question, so what does the Jaguar do on the robot? It's probably been a little while, but uh, after a few seconds, I think you'll, you'll kind of remember, and the general consensus of your idea or your answers would, would be that it provides battery uh, power to the motor, which is correct. An engineer might answer that is that it's a speed controller. So uh, that's also correct. Um, some people might say motor controller. The idea that I want to convey, though, is that on a, on a speed controller, the way the Jaguar works, we're, we pick a value minus one to one, so minus one being full reverse, positive one being full forward. We pick a value, and we set that uh, to say that's our desired uh, output. And the the Jaguar will try to convert uh, the energy uh, from the battery on the inputs, convert that uh, to the motor, and the motor will will try to settle around that value. So, for example, uh, last year. Uh, when the robot was on the ramp and the user was uh, holding the joystick full forward, meaning so that was a positive one, um, the robot may not have been moving. The ramp was very steep. Uh, we were trying to go forward. The, the motors were trying, but we weren't actually, there wasn't uh, any uh, spinning motion. So uh, think of this as a desired value, not as a guaranteed value. Um, for a guaranteed value, it gets a more complicated to pull that off, especially under something like uh, with a ramp. So, but I, I imagine that uh, no one's answer would have included that it's a safety device, and that's that's really key. I, if it's on a robot, it it should have something to do with safety. I mean, if you think about that, it's all over the place. Why do we have fuses for safety? Or why do we have a power distribution board for safety? Why do we have a controller for safety? Now. Calling it a safety device, though, assumes that there's only one motor hooked up. So we would hook a motor up on this side, but we would not want to hook two motors up. So it would not be that would go to one motor and then to a second motor. We would not do that. Um, there's a reason why you wouldn't do that, and it, it comes down to a circuit's answer, and we can talk about that in a later video. Okay, so I want to talk about block diagrams momentarily. And uh, here's an example component. So this, this uh, square in the center here, um, you can think of this as a circuit, uh, like built into a chip. Um, you could think of it as a physical device, like a motor uh, or Jaguar is what we'll talk about momentarily. But I want you to get the idea first that the left side of the, of the block, we always draw our inputs. So we have three here. We always draw those on the left. On the right side, we always draw our outputs for a forward uh, block, uh, diagram. We draw the uh, inputs on the left, outputs on the right. Now, some devices will have options, and we'll put those along the bottom. So you might think of those being here. Um, so now, very basic uh, diagrams. What do we mean by an input? Well, for example, if we have a constant, we uh, constant input, it may be a number, say like the number nine, if if that means something. It may be a function of time, something that changes. Like in that, you could think of uh, a sensor, uh, a time, and you could just be counting in you know, a time. It may be connected to like a joystick, or something like that. So, as if you push the button, for example. <clears throat> An output is the same thing. It's usually just a function of the inputs. So, you know, it could be a function of uh, input one, input two, and so on. And so, in that way, we like to think of uh, just very simple block diagrams inputs on the left, outputs on the right, options on the bottom. So let's take a look now. This is a drawing from the data spec sheet of the Jaguar, so you can get this from Texas Instruments. So let's let's notice something first here. We have inputs on the left, and outputs on the right, so these go to the motor. These come from the power distribution board. Uh, and our inputs, or excuse me, our options. 
Now, in normal, the way we on the team have used this in the past, we've hooked up, we've hooked up this, 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 and usually the PWM cable here. That's one way to use the Jaguar. There's another way where rather than use the PWM, you use this and this. These these look like a small Ethernet cable or a telephone cable. Uh, and there's an input side and an output side. Um, and here are some options that can be used in either mode using the, the CAN. I didn't describe that, but this is called the CAN or controller area network. This is called PWM. And this is just a signaling wire that we hook up uh, to our digital sidecar. And so what you're seeing here is that physically uh, they've created the Jaguar to look like a block diagram. So I, you know the easy question is why did they do that? And it just boils down to well they think they think in terms of block diagrams and so why not make the device in block diagrams and then it looks like what you draw on paper. So now let's let's relate this uh, to control and so control is a loaded word and, and what we mean here is it's a it's a field of theory uh, it's usually done by electrical engineers mechanical engineers aerospace aeronautical engineers um, you know and others but uh, control is basically about you have a system and you want it to do something and we're gonna look at this some simple uh, cases in block diagrams so let's take a look at one uh, this is called a feed-forward system. We'll talk about that in a second. The idea is that you have a system. This is some device. This could be like a motor. It could be the robot, you know, in, in, in high abstract levels. It could be whatever you need it to be. And you have your controller. Think of this as uh, performing some math or understanding uh, the command is the bottom line. It understands the command and then it figures out what does the system, uh, what system input is needed to do that command. And so the controller relates command to system input, and then the system, of course, takes a system input and it makes a system output. So, for example, on a motor, a system input could be a voltage and a, a power in, and then the system output is a mechanical rotation. So a motor takes electrical energy, converts it to mechanical energy. If I put a generator in there, a generator takes mechanical energy, converts it to electrical energy. So that's the general idea. What is a system? Now you may say, well, what about the options? And this is just a simplified block diagram, so we don't always show every single wire in, every single wire out. You, you may just need to be aware that such things are on the actual physical system. So the controller, you can think of this as a couple things. Now, first, I want to just say, if we throw in the motor, we can put a Jaguar there. So the Jaguar can take a command, and this is in the, in the case of the PWM, and we'll talk about in a different video what PWM is. It takes a PWM, or CAN, controller area network, and it taking that input determines an electrical power to send to the motor. Now, in a feed-forward system, it's it's not an idealized thing, but in terms of how humans like to think of things, um, we really like feed forward systems. Like I, I, do, I would just say, hey, robot, go over there. You know, uh, hey, car, go park yourself. And I would like, you know, it, the car doesn't come ask me, did I park myself correctly? The car would just know. You know, I don't. It, you just issue a command, and you just know it. You 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 rely on that it happens. So uh, feed forward is something that we really like among humans um, so that we can devote our energy and efforts to something else. Now in terms of a robot and what we're working on, that's a little bit um, difficult to do. And, and we can kind of we can say that uh, from past examples for uh, like autonomous. If we don't align the robot up perfectly on the field, and we issued a feed forward command of drive forward for five seconds, uh, stop, 
and then you know, shoot the, the ball. Well, if we don't align ourselves perfectly on the field each time, uh, then we have a different output for each input. Well, it's the, I should say for the same input. You know, we, we, we told it to drive forward for five seconds, and it, it, it did that, but where it ended up on the field was different than uh, where we expected. So uh, feed forward systems uh, are, they can be difficult to implement depending on what you're working on, uh, but if you have one, it's really nice. So how do we do this in terms of our robot? Well, we, we use what's called feedback. And so in this case, all we've done is add a sensor. So uh, let's talk about this. What you're seeing here is a loop. So the sensor, now I, previously I showed you that the inputs are on the left and the outputs are on the right, but you notice that the sensor, we, we just draw it backwards. And that's just to make the, the picture pretty. Uh, you, you know, it's just an understanding thing on your part that the, the way the wiring is so that we don't have to um, draw an ugly block diagram. The sensor gives us some value out. and This is, this is a measured value. Um, and so some examples of sensors that we can use it could be an accelerometer, uh, a gyroscope, um, an encoder which uh, can use uh, magnetic or optical and an encoder it just determines a, a rotary position so with that information we then do a comparison so we have a reference value so this reference value can come from our programming it can come from a joystick value something that we choose and it compares so here what we're doing is called negative feedback and that's why there's a negative sign um, if we had put a positive sign here we call it positive feedback now uh, when it comes to how systems are designed, you have to take into account which one are you using, positive or negative. And the idea is a, a positive feedback, for example, is something like uh, if you're in an auditorium and they have a microphone system and uh, someone speaks, and, but the, the speaker and the microphone clash with one another and you, you, you build up a positive feedback and then the room, it becomes a disaster, everyone's you know, ears hurt. Uh, so that's something like a positive feedback. A negative feedback uh, we think of is usually driving the system to a stable point. And so the idea is, uh, say for example we told the robot to drive forward uh, five feet. So the sensor, we would find a way to somehow uh, measure uh, something determining uh, inches or feet that we've moved. So if if we originally set it to be five feet and we haven't moved yet, so that would be zero, this comparison here is five, so that would be our measured error. The controller would have to use this five or some other number to determine uh, what it should do next. And in the case of this, it would say, okay, drive forward. Now, if our controller is not designed correctly, uh, the positive five error may cause it to drive backwards. And so we had told it to drive forward it drove backwards. Um, we would call that an, an unstable system. It's it's taking the wrong action. It was uh, it was on one side of the set point or the reference, and it went the wrong way. So if we move backwards, then the the eventually the measured error becomes six, seven, eight, and so on. So we don't get the desired uh, effect that we had intended for. And so usually, how do you fix that? Well, that just means that there's some constants or something that you change the sign. And then you would see that the five, rather than counting up, would count down. So the controller takes that value and figures out a system input. And so in this case, that just determines the current that goes into the motor. And then the motor takes the action of, of motion. And then we see it move. The robot would physically move. That sensor would have to read that value. And then in the next loop, so the reference would stay the same the the measured output changes which means the measured error changes so then let's say this turns to four so we've moved four units we went from zero to four then the measured error becomes five minus four which is one so we've counted down uh, which is good so the controller then has takes a, a different action based on this measured one 
based on what that is, it determines what to make the motor speed. In this case, maybe say because we move so fast, uh, close, closing in on the five uh, value so fast, maybe it would slow down the motors. So we're starting to you know uh, get into the correct position, and so on. So let me just go ahead and erase a few things here. And eventually, hopefully, what we want to see is that this measured value five or this measured output I should say becomes five the measured error becomes zero the controller no longer has to take any action it's done what it's supposed to and then the the motors are not given any uh, current so the, the motors don't move the robot stays in place so some of the ideas attached to this come from and this block diagram by the way came from a Wikipedia article on control theory it'd be a good idea for you to go read it just it's not about the math it simply talks about some of the history some of the people some of the general concepts. So with that, I'm going to close it out here and leave it at that.